Okay, uh, we written up the expression for it last time. It was uh, uh, d to the z, you know, apart from all these factors, of cs to n g to the fourth, uh, and the delta function for momentum conservation. That's all the way to there. Uh, it was uh, d to z mod z to the power, uh, uh, what was it? Alpha prime u by 2 minus 4 and uh, 1 minus z to the power alpha prime t by 2 minus 4. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so this is the expression that we're interested in, uh, in studying in more detail. Okay, so we're going to study aspects, many aspects of this, this, this relationship, but before we actually uh, study in detail, uh, just to remind you again that uh, this expression is not viewed as an analytic function of u and t. It's not, uh, uh, well, first thing to remind you, alpha prime u plus uh, t plus s is equal to minus 16. It's a kind of natural relationship we, we found last time. And, uh, uh, okay, so viewed as an analytic expression in u and t, it's not everywhere convergent yet. Okay, what's the condition for convergence? The condition for convergence is first thing that alpha prime u by 2 minus 4 is greater than minus u. And alpha prime t by 2 minus 4 is greater than minus 2. But also that alpha prime u by 2 minus 4 plus uh, alpha prime t by 2 minus 4 is uh, that the sum of these two is uh, uh, less than minus two. So it dies up at infinity. Uh, let me, let's quickly check. So what was it? So k1 plus k2, the whole thing squared, plus k1 plus k the whole thing squared plus k1 plus k4 the whole thing squared, which is 3k1 squared, and then from that momentum conservation we got another minus 2k1. So that's k1 squared. Uh, is this the minus sum over n squared? Why, why minus? Uh, it's k1, k1 squared is minus n squared, which is plus. K1 squared is. K1 squared. Uh, so all these are positive. K1 squared is for that. All these are positive. Right. So then maybe I want to. Uh, okay, good. But now let's let's remind ourselves what uh, uh, so this one, uh, I'm getting confused to given over the sixteen now. What, so this is each of these is four by uh, alpha prime. Uh, and there are four. Right. Okay, good. So we've got plus sixteen. Um, maybe that's plus sorry. That's probably. Let me just check them. Just get it. He's using the same. Uh, he has minus 16, but then he puts a minus alpha prime u. So his, his u is probably minus of k1 plus k2. Though. So, okay, so let's. Um, maybe we should try to be consistent. Okay, so we put a minus here and a minus here. Uh, we change our definition to S is equal to minus of uh, K1 plus K2 to the whole thing squared, which is a good thing actually. S will be positive at high energies this way. That's, that's T is equal to minus of K1 plus K2 to the whole thing squared, and U is equal to minus of K1 to the squared. And then this thing is right to the minus. Okay, thank you, Dr. Okay, so um, in order for 
for uh, uh, this to converge, the sum of these two from these two relations has to be greater than minus 4. It also has to be less than minus 2. Well, that's, that's fine, so there's a window between minus 4 and minus 2 in which all three relations can be satisfied. Okay, so there's a place where it's convergent, so we evaluate it there and uh, evaluate the entire expression by adding the continuation. Okay, so, uh, so that's our goal. Okay, so in order to do this, we have to understand how to do this in 10. So we can spend 10 minutes doing this in 10. Okay. Um, so we're going to spend 10 minutes doing the intent. Yeah. Now with this, this should be minus and minus. This whole coefficient here has to be greater than minus 2 for in order to get convergence at 0. The other coefficient has to be greater than minus 2 in order to get convergence at 1. And the sum of the two coefficients has to be less than minus 2 in order to get convergence at infinity. But it's important that these three conditions can simultaneously be fulfilled. Okay? So, the integral that we want to perform is an integral of the following form. It's an integral of the form mod z to the power 2a minus 2 1 minus z to the power 2b minus 2 uh, d to z, okay, where uh, a is equal to minus of alpha prime u by 4 plus 1. B is equal to minus of alpha prime t by 4 plus 1. Okay. Now, let's see what we get from a plus uh, uh, from a plus b. You see, if we take a plus b, we find uh, minus 2 and then from here we have uh, uh, from here we have alpha prime by 4 ok so let's write it down minus alpha prime u by 4 minus alpha prime t by 4 but remember that the sum of alpha prime by 4 with a minus sign is plus 4 so this thing can be written as uh, uh, a plus b is equal to uh, minus 2 plus 4 plus alpha prime uh, C is equal to uh, alpha, so that's equal to 2 plus alpha prime s by 4. So if we define C is equal to 1 plus alpha prime s by 4, you know, the symmetrical definition, then we see that we have a plus b plus c is equal to 1. Okay? So we have an A associated with u by uh, uh, I suppose I have a minus sign. Let's see, sorry. I went up minus sign. Yeah. Okay? So, we have A associated with U by this formula, B associated with U, with T, uh, with T by this formula, and C associated with S by the same formula. Okay? So, uh, so, 
As far as this integral is concerned, I'm going to just simply define a C such that a plus b plus c is equal to 1 and write the answer in some symmetrical way in terms of a, b, and c. And we know what c is in terms of x. Here we can express everything in terms of two variables if we want, but it'll look more symmetrical if we express in terms of three. Okay? So now let's go ahead and do the integral. So this is the integral that we want. So how are we going to do this integral? So it's no. I want a plus b plus c equal to 1. Okay. So let's do this integral. So we're interested in uh, this integral here. Uh, and in order to do it, we're going to use a trick. Well, we're going to use the fact that mod z squared uh, to the power a minus 1 can, can is the same thing as dt t to the power minus a e to the power minus mod z squared t divided by one one over gamma of now what is it? Um, if you have t to the power n plus 1, we have gamma of n. So minus a can be written as minus a minus 1 plus 1. So this is of minus a minus 1. Is that c. Dz times dz. 
which is twice of dx dy. Because the determinant between z and z bar, and x and y, the Jacobian determinant is 2. Okay? So, uh, this. Quantity now can be written as 2 times d dt du dx dy dx. That is x branch. And let's simplify the x branch. So we simplify the x branch by completing squares. So it's minus t plus u into x into uh, okay. Let's first write it out the x squared plus y squared. Then uh, there is the linear term in x, which is uh, plus 2xu, and then there's the constant piece, which is uh, minus u. And we, of course, have, oh, sorry. Uh, here we had, of course, also the t to the power minus a and u to the power minus a. So we get that as well. t to the power minus a, u to the power minus a. Okay, so the next step what we do is to complete the square of the exponent. So we have 2 t to the power minus a, u to the power minus b, d, d, d u, d, x, d, y, exponential of um, okay, so now when we complete the square, uh, we, we get something, so uh, some shift in x, okay, so it's uh, t plus u into x minus what's the shift, it's u by t plus u plus y squared, and then we have to do the subtraction here which gives us uh, minus u and then plus of uh, uh, u square over t plus u. Okay, so that's 2 t to the power minus a u to the power minus b dt du dx dy exponential of uh, minus t plus u into this square business and then let's simplify this that is equal to minus of t u divided by t. Okay, so now the next stage of course we do the uh, Gaussian integrals in x in the shifted x and, and y so that gets rid of the x and y integrals and we pick up a factor, factor of square root pi, the whole thing squared, so that's 2 pi. I mean, you have 2 here, so that's 2 pi times integral t to the power minus a, u to the power minus b, d, u, d, uh, t, exponential of minus t, u by t plus Okay? Uh, I'm, I'm going through this in some boring detail, by the way, because this is, you know, one of the same, you know, one of the first formula of string theory, which is particularly Okay, so now the next step. And the next step, what we do, we, well, we've done some simplification, but we still have two integrals to do how we do. Okay, so the next step, what we do is to say, well, let's switch variables to an overall scale in TU space and a ratio. So let t is equal to be alpha x and u be equal to 1 minus x is alpha. Okay? So let's do uh, let's work out the determinant uh, the Jacobian for this change of variables. So dt by dx is alpha. Uh, okay, let's say dt by d alpha is x, dt by d x is alpha, uh, d u by d alpha is 1 minus x and du by the x at minus alpha. So if this is the determinant of change of variables, uh, which is equal to, you know, whose modulus is equal to 1. 
at the x alpha pieces. Okay, so there's no there's no uh, Jacobian for the Fine. So we can rewrite this expression here as two pi. Then uh, this becomes uh, the, then the integral over alpha is distributed, right? So so what's the integral over alpha? So we get two pi uh, alpha to the power minus. Uh, Oh, sorry. So this is, uh, this is Jacobi's is equal to alpha. The alpha right. So alpha to the power minus u minus sorry, minus a minus b. Uh, we have a plus one. Okay. Times then we have x to the power a one minus x to the power b. And then we have exponential of minus alpha in the x into one. It is Jacobians are, you know, what? I mean, we, 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 it's a positive integral. We we worry about the sign. Yeah, I mean, we don't know. Okay, so. Uh, now that we do the integral over alpha, so the integral over alpha gives us what? Uh, firstly, we get gamma of a plus b, uh, of minus a plus b. Right? Uh, and somewhere along the way, we lost our 1 over gamma. Uh, we lost that 1 over uh, uh, gamma, we put them back in. It's just board spaces a little bit. So we have 2 pi over, let's put it back in now. So gamma of minus a minus b over gamma of 1 minus a into gamma of 1 minus b. Okay? Uh, times, uh, what, uh, times we get this factor of x into 1 minus x from power. Okay? Uh, Times the factor of x into 1 minus x from all counting. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, for each factor of alpha, we should get a 1 over x into 1 minus x. Okay? So uh, we get integral uh, dx x to the power minus b plus 2 1 minus x to the power minus a plus 2 Factor of alpha has a one over. So sorry. Okay. So we should, when we have an alpha, we should take it to x to the power minus one, uh, one minus x to the power minus one. Uh, so we have this factor, but we also have an alpha plus two. So this should be replaced by x to the power minus 1, 1 minus x to the power minus 1 into minus, so we should make those pluses, so a plus b minus minus 2, 2 because there was a d outside of these other ones. Okay, and we have uh, x to the power a, 1 minus x to the power Thank you. 
Uh, we should have got a factor of uh, 1 over t plus. Just 1 over root t plus u squared. Because it's x squared and y squared. Just a factor of 1 over t plus. Yeah, so that would be another factor of alpha. Oh my, I hope we can trace this to the length here. I mean, the previous question is something like that. Uh, is this fair? Thank you, thank you for pointing it out. Uh, so we have a 1 over t plus u. Thank you. Um, There's a redefinition of x in the uh, I think the coefficient of x squared is different from the coefficient of No, it's not different from the coefficient. x squared and x minus shift. Yes, yeah, but there's no shift by t plus. What? It, it, it doesn't matter. If you, if you write it as a. Oh, okay, okay. okay. It's, it's x oh, minus u by t plus u. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so there's 1 over t plus u here. Maybe, maybe I'll at some point go to the answer. But, 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 but let's try. Uh, okay, maybe it's not. But okay, let's, let's try it. So, okay. so what do we get? We had a t to the power minus a Yeah, we had t to the power minus a u to the power minus b d u d d t so, the, what, uh, uh, power, powers of alpha we now get by homogeneity, right? So it's alpha to the power minus a minus b plus one. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, no, there is no plus one here, but there'll be the d alpha. Uh, Right. This just cancels the alpha we get from the Jacobian. Right, so it's the same. Okay. So this gives us a gamma of uh, plus one. Uh, t to the n is gamma of n plus one. Plus one. Okay. I 
maybe it's something. Let's, 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 let's just go through. This thing by, you know, there's this beta function formula which tells you that this thing is equal to gamma of 2a plus b into gamma of 2b plus a into gamma of the sum of the two. Always, man. Uh, okay. So the uh, the range of integra integration for T and U is zero to infinity. Uh, and alpha and e x goes from zero to one, and alpha goes from zero to infinity. Right. Uh, I was messed up. You know, I've messed up on some sign somewhere. Uh, hey, just give me one, and I'm sorry about this. But there are previously different variables, and then it's all I have to do with which is key lines. You would like is it? Yeah, you give me one more minute. And similarly for B and C. 
Okay? So our formula is uh, S is equal to what? So when we have all these delta functions we can never write down. Uh, times Cs2 times G tachyon to the power 4 times 2 pi times gamma of now we have an ABC in the denominator in the in the numerator. So minus 1 minus alpha prime u by 2 by 4. Okay, let me write it in the next line. In gamma of minus 1 minus alpha prime u by 4, gamma of minus 1 minus alpha prime s by 4, gamma of minus 1 minus alpha prime t by 4. The whole is divided, right? Now we have, we need 1 minus a. So that is divided by gamma of 2 plus alpha prime u by 4, gamma of 2 plus alpha prime t by 4, gamma of 2 plus alpha prime. Okay, into this is 2 pi to the part 26 times the delta function of sum over omega. Let me go. That take from zero. Okay, so that's our final formula. This is the S matrix for the scattering of order. You, you see that this claim that we made uh, in the last class, that even though it wasn't obviously symmetric. Uh, uh, under the interchange of XT and U, the answer is, is manifest in this form, the form Okay. Okay, any questions or comments about, about this before we proceed to study this Okay. This part is alpha prime T by 4 by 1. What is obvious about this? Alpha prime this part of the thing. Alpha prime u by 4. Alpha prime, no, you see, at the moment it's a function of an arbitrary complex number. It, it's like there's no, no claim about positive. Wait up. Okay. So, 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 so let's, 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 uh, let's just start with immediately address the question that you have. Okay? So the question that you're looking at was, well, this formula has, has poles. Okay? So what do the poles be? So let's first understand what the first pole is. So let's suppose we're working with variable s. So this has pole, it's completely symmetric for three variables. So any statement about the poles in one variable will, will be reflected in the other. So let's say we're working with the variable s. Okay? So now s, the way we've done it, is... Um, um, uh, is something positive and gets increasingly positive as we go to higher and higher energies. Okay? Therefore, this gamma function here gets increasingly negative as we go to higher and higher energies. So we keep running into for more and more poles. This gamma of a, minor, of a negative integer has a pole. So let's see what the first one is, what the lowest energy pole is. Okay? So the first time we get a pole, is when this this object goes to zero. So we have minus one minus alpha prime s by four is equal to zero. Okay, that's the first time we hit the pole in the variable s. That's the uh, smallest value of s for which we hit the pole, and that occurs when s is equal to, and s is equal to minus four by alpha. Now, what does it mean to have a pole at s equals minus 4 by alpha? Somebody tell me that. Exactly. Which, you see what's happening is that we have, we've already seen that our theory has a 3 tachyon vertex. In fact, we can't do it. So, if you have 2 tachyons, 
propagating, they can scan that into a third of them, which can then produce two more atoms. So in this diagram that I've drawn, all, all lines here are atoms. This contribution, you see, this answer is the full answer for the S matrix. It's not, you know, some uh, uh, effective action from which you have to build trees. It's the full answer for the S matrix. So it includes tree level exchange of all particles in the middle. Okay? So, every particle that you can get by, by colliding two tachyons and running in, the, in, a, in a channel will contribute, and each of these contributions will give you a point. Okay? So, uh, in particular, uh, what is the mass spectrum of string theory? Well, the mass spectrum of string the, 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 the spectrum of closed strings is at uh, m squared equals um, 4 by r top, right? Into n minus 1, where n is all possible integers, the number operator of the, of, of the oscillators. Okay? So, from general considerations, we should expect the pole in S at every value of S that is that takes this form for any integer n. Now let's check when do we actually have poles. When do we have a, actually have poles? We have poles when alpha prime s by 4 minus minus 1 is equal to minus n, which tells you that's when alpha prime s by 4 is equal to n minus 1. So you put the 4 by, so s is equal to 4 by alpha prime n minus 1. We see it's exactly the same places. Okay. So our scattering amplitude has poles, but it has poles exactly where we should expect them to be for physical purposes. Okay, now that we understand this, of course it's the same in the T channel or the U channel. It's the same thing. Now that we understand this, okay, the next thing we should do is to try to understand this a little better. So you say, well, 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 okay, if you're so smart. You should be able to, you know, not just say it has a pole, but, it, but, but check that the residue is the right thing. Okay? So let's see. So what did we have? We had that the, this scattering amplitude, remember, was GT Q times CS. The other one was the same thing. So, uh, so the pole from this process, the residue of the pole should be gt to the 6, that is cs2 squared, should be equal to the rest. Okay? But now what do we find for the residue? We find for the residue gt to the 4th times cs2 times, times what? Well, we should plug alpha prime we should plug S is equal to minus of 4 by alpha prime into this. Okay, the suppose we plug S is equal to minus of 4 by alpha prime into this. What do we get? Um, well, let's see. Firstly, from here, we get gamma of 1, which is 1. But then we have all this other stuff floating around. But I claim, I claim that the other stuff cancels. Let's see how that works. It's actually easiest to see. You know, you have the formula gamma A, gamma B, gamma C over gamma of 1 minus A, gamma of 1 minus B, gamma of 1 minus C. And where we got our first pole is when let's say A was equal to C. Okay? So when A is equal to 0, B is 1 minus C. And C is 1 minus B. So this, this gamma of B cancels the gamma of 1 minus C. And gamma of C cancels gamma of 1 minus B. Okay? So you see that the residue to this pole, uh, the, res the residue here, so, so, so I'm claiming that the structure, it's the same thing here, harder to see because there are more, more gish, yeah? So we said S to the same, uh, uh, we, we set S equal to 0 and we get, well what do we get? We get that 
in the neighborhood of that, sorry, we said s equals this thing equals zero. We get that in the neighborhood of that, we get g t to the four times c s q times q pi times times one over this quantity. So one over s minus uh, alpha prime by four into s minus four, or s plus four. Right? I've just written this quantity is modulus value in, a, in the appropriate way. I didn't What's this? S. Is it okay? Okay? So in the neighborhood of this, this ball, this is what that function looks like. So what's the recipe of the ball? Well, the recipe of the ball in S plus 4 by alpha prime is alpha, uh, so that's 8 pi by alpha prime times CS2 times 2 pi, which times GT to the 4, which should be the same thing as GT to the 6 times CS2. Now you see, the, the point is the one. We didn't know with what number we should put each vertex operator to start. That's why, that's why we had this GT, which was some three. three. Now this relationship in physics tells us that these two should be equal. So we cancel this to make this square, we cancel one factor of CS2, and uh, we find that GT squared is equal to 8 pi by alpha prime divided by CS2. So you want to treat all these things seriously from unitary. Basic rules of filtering unit. Okay? We 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 obtain what the right value is for the um, you know for the uh, uh, for the pre that we have to put beyond behind the tag. Okay, so there's no check here, but it's a way of determining what the right answer is for the big time. Now, of course, once we determine that now, if we calculate five and six point functions, the that one, then there will be checks. Okay? And those all work out. We're not going to do that. I mean, we're not going to try to do that. But uh, if we determine it once and for all, and now this, every time you have a that one operator, this is what you have to put in. Is this clear? Okay, now that we have what GT squared is in terms of CS2, what GT squared is in terms of CS2, let's go back and look at our, uh, uh, let's go back and look at our uh, three-point function cal calculation involving one graviton and two tachyons, and uh, uh, see what we can say about the normalization. If you remember from last time, we had an alpha prime by uh, by four the whole thing squared times k two three mu uh, k two three mu e mu. We had the uh, the amplitude for for one graviton scatter to. Uh, a graviton in particle one to scatter to uh, tachyons, which are particles two and three, to be proportional to this object. We also prime by four in those a factor of two in our basic formula for their x, and there was a second factor of two because we we took k two and made it uh, uh, we took k two and made it k two minus k three by two. Okay, now. Uh, this was dressed with one with, with a GT square and then a G master. Okay? 
that was also addressed with the CS. But now, GT squared times CS2 we know. It's 85 by 5. So this thing is the same thing as GM times uh, alpha prime by 2. And then there's a pi. Okay, as I'm not, yeah, not giving that sign that we pack factors of the i. Yeah. So alpha prime by 2 times pi times k to 3 mu, k to 3 nu times e mu nu times g. Oops, g and mu. Uh, last class, uh, you might remember, I was getting confused about this normalization of action with Pulchinski. But Pulchinski, that is plugged in this relationship. So that's why I got to the 1 alpha, right? And this matches the one, yes. Okay, very good. So this is now the three point function of two tachyons and the graviton, but it's still not clear what it is because we still don't know what, the, what GM is, but G for the master state, for the gravitons. So how do we compute that? Well, I'm not going to actually go through the calculation because it's not It's not difficult to do, but I'm not going to go through it to get all the numbers, right? But let me just indicate how it works. Okay? Once again, we want to take this four-point function calculation and factorize it on the pole. But this time, we work with pole at s is equal to 4 by alpha prime. It will be the pole at s is equal to 0. Okay? So when we factorize it on the pole, we get two factors of this vertex. Okay, Time, uh, divided by the pole. So the residue should be two factors of this vertex divided by the pole. Now there's not one massless particle, there are many massless particles. We're supposed to sum over all massless particles in the game. So, so we get factors of this, another factor uh, with with another with an e prime here, uh, factors of momentum, and then we're supposed to sum over all polarizations. That sum over polarizations can be done giving you a completeness. Okay? Uh, so when you do that, and you plug it all in, you get some powers of t. Right? Because you have two factors of momentum at each vertex. So you get four factors of momentum at the end, which will in the end turn into something invariant. So it'll be some power of t uh, that is quadratic. Okay? So you get some some power of t or t. Some 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 uh, just schematically, it's capable of four. Uh, that you get out of the your pole. Okay, now you can go back and ask is that the kind of residue that you actually get from, a, from the forward function? Okay, so let's study just without putting it with ABCR uh, for a moment. So uh, suppose we study with ABCR, suppose we look at gamma of A, gamma B, gamma C over gamma of 1 minus A, gamma of 1 minus B, gamma of 1 minus C. We saw that if we looked at the pole at A equals 0, the answer was independent of B and C. The rest of that, that pole is independent. So now we can ask, you know, is this way to continue? If we look at the rest of the pole at A equals minus 1, is the answer still independent of B and C? And the answer is no, it isn't. So if we look at the pole at A equals, let's say, minus N, okay, then uh, B will be equal to, so, so now let's say that we can substitute, we can, since A plus B is, plus C is equal to 1, okay, since A plus B plus C is equal to 1, we can substitute for one of these, so let's say we substitute for C in terms of B, so C will be equal to 1 plus A, uh, plus B, minus B. Okay, so if A is equal to minus N, C will be equal to this. So, so what we will get is something of the form of uh, 1 by A times uh, N factorial times gamma of B, gamma of 1 plus N minus B over gamma of 1 minus B times gamma of 1 minus 
So 1 plus B minus A. Now when A equals equal to 0, uh, the 1 is cancelled, sorry, B minus A. Right? So when A equals equal to 0, when A equals equal to 0, this cancels this, this cancels this, and uh, we were very happy. Okay? But when n is not equal to 0, we don't have perfect cancellation. However, we can use properties of the gamma functions. The fact that gamma of n plus 1 is n times gamma of n. We get a simple formula for this. Let's do it for n equals 1. So for, uh, for n equals 1, what do we have? We have gamma of b, gamma of uh, uh, 2 minus b, over gamma of 1 minus b into gamma of b minus 1. Now this thing is equal to b minus 1 into gamma of b minus 1. And this thing is equal to 1 minus b into gamma of 1 minus b. So we get b minus 1 into 1 minus b okay, into, uh, uh, into 1. Using the formula of gamma of n, and n plus 1 is n times gamma of n. Okay. You can check more generally that uh, if, you, if, we, if we went, well, you, you can easily work out the formula that you get at high end. It's like b minus 1 lower thing squared to b minus 2 lower thing squared. Okay. But uh, let's remember in our context what, what this. Uh, uh, okay. I have a little pulling approach for it. Much more. You, you can work this out in terms of ST and U, compare with, uh, convert that to momenta, see that it matches what you get from, from this thing. The key point is that it's something quadratic in the T's, okay, which is something quadratic in the momenta, as you as you expect it from uh, this, and then you can try to work it out in more detail, work out the numbers. Okay, uh, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to work it out. Very good. Sorry. So the, the key point here that I forgot to say that when, when you do this, of course, you get all the momentum part matching, but there's some number that's left, okay? And then the GM will just be fixed uh, by, by, by the by matching. And when, when you do that carefully, what you find GM is two divided by uh, two divided by uh, you get GM is equal to G tachyon times. Uh, you, you see. You have two factors of GM left, and uh, you have two. Uh, uh, you, you get GM is equal to G. You see, you have the, the, the three points you had was GT was G had, had a GT uh, uh, square times GM, and the four-point function has a GT to the four, so the GT is cancelled, and then you get GM is, but there's a CS two that's left. Which you can re express in terms of GT. So in the end, then you know you get GM is equal to GT uh, to 2 divided by Okay. Now, there's actually another way. Um, there's actually another way of uh, uh, working out the relative ratio between these two numbers. And that is through the state operator. You see, the logic for these vertex operators was they were the operators that corresponded to a given state. Now, you can ask, but with what normalization should we put the operator? Well, if you think of, think of it through the state operator map, there's no ambiguity. We should put the state with the normalization 1. And work out the operator that is dual to that state with normalization 1. Now, in addition to all of that, you may want to put an overall factor because you're computing an estimate. But the relative normalization between the two operators are two different things should be fixed by this. Okay? So I'm going to leave this for you as an exercise. Work out the relative normalization from the state operator map of the vertex operators for the massless states compared to the vertex operators for the DAC. Okay? Being careful to ensure that the states to which your operators are dual are unit normalized. Okay? You'll find the same. You'll find the same. Okay, so there's some sort of check. There's some sort of check for this problem. So once you get confident about this logic, you just 
use the state operator man, operator man to find the coefficient that you put for for behind Benny's vertex operators, rather than calculating it every time and perhaps perform a few checks based on that. Is this check? Okay, great. Now the last thing I wanted to, uh, the last two things I wanted to tell you about uh, before we quickly turn this so we can prepare for load now and talk. Uh, is about the high energy behavior. It's about the high energy behavior of these activities. Um, so, oh, actually, before that, let me quickly say one thing. You know, we had all this fancy analysis involving the uh, involving the exact uh, answer in order to determine the poles and the residues. But if we just want to determine the first pole, it's actually very easy to do directly from the uh, first integral. Okay, uh, and that's uh, we have z to the power minus alpha prime by four u minus minus four times stuff as regular you know, uh, at z equals zero, and we want to do this integral. We want to do the integral d to z. Okay, so what do we do? We want the neighborhood of that thing. About being about to become convergent, so we uh, we take this and we convert it into a radial and an angular integral. We get four pi from the angular integral because our measure d two z is twice the x dy. Okay, then this becomes r dr r to the power minus alpha prime u by four minus four minus minus one. What was it? Sorry, let me set the formula right. Ah, by two months. I'll find you by two months. Okay, and then uh, and then the, 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 uh, the, then as long as this is sufficiently negative so that it's convergent, we know the answer is integral. Um, it is, it is. Uh, so um, r to the power n has derivative n. So if we integrate r to the power n, we get one over. N plus one. Fine. So we get uh, so we get one over alpha prime u by two plus two. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. This has become minus three, and then this plus one. Okay. So that's eight by over alpha prime u plus uh, 8 pi by alpha prime into u plus alpha prime by 4. It's the same pole. Okay? So, uh, if you just want the residue of the pole, at least the first guy, this is the simplest way to get it, just to check that we haven't done anything crazy in our exact evaluation. Okay, last last thing, last last thing next. Uh, just so that I can expect to go on to something else. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about is the high energy behavior of these activities. Okay, uh, so for that purpose, I need to rewrite the uh, scattering amplitude in terms of ST and U. I'm going to ask for help from somebody who's taking that notes. So why was it just 2 pi and product of 3 gammas divided by product of 3 gammas? Can you help me fill up the arguments of these? Minus one minus alpha prime. Minus one minus alpha prime x by four. Okay. Okay, and then similarly. Right. And uh, minus alpha two. prime u by four. Oh, answer. Right. Okay. So now there are two high energy limits that are of interest for different purposes. The first high energy limit that's of that's of interest is the limit in which we take 
S goes to infinity, T goes to infinity, U goes to infinity. Back of, you know, with, uh, by modulus of S goes to infinity, modulus of T goes to infinity, modulus. Because S plus T plus U is equal to 1. So they can't all go to positive infinity, but they can all become very large and can be able to do it away S plus T plus U equals, F, equals 1. So uh, before working out the answer there, let me remind you what that means. So suppose you've got some particles, suppose we work in the center of mass spread. And we have two particles colliding at each other in the x direction. So we have uh, uh, particles whose energies come. This is k1, let's say. And k2 is momentum is added to zero, so we're in the center of mass frame, but the time the energy is not added to zero. Right. So we've got uh, and we probably want it. Right. Okay. So suppose we've got uh, things coming together like this. Okay. And uh, the uh, say k3 is what k1 becomes after its deviation. So it becomes square root s by 2 times 1 cos theta sine theta 1. So with theta was 0, we know that. And k4 was square root s by 2, you know, 1 minus cos theta minus sine theta 0. So the momentum can be reached as to 0 after its capture. Thank you. Okay, so this strip, uh, this is the this this is the momentum uh, diagram. Something that comes in like this, and then scatters at an angle theta. K one, K three, K uh, K two, and K four. Okay. So now it's a simple matter with this momentum configuration to calculate S, D, and S, D, and U. For instance, S is S. We've set it up that way. You know, you add the two of these, the momentum cancels, the factor of two goes here, then you take the square and get S. Okay? But uh, uh, now we want to calculate T. Basically, the point is that suppose you keep the angle fixed, suppose you keep theta to be some fixed angle. And then S to infinity. Then everything will go to infinity. S will go to infinity, T will go to infinity, U will go to infinity. Because everything is multiplying some fixed function of theta with this, with this factor X. So, this limit here corresponds to high angle, high energy fixed angles. Keep angles fixed, then the energy very large, study what's going on. You know, then the limit S, T, U are going to much. Okay, so the question that we wanted to ask question we want to ask is what happens to our formula in this high energy fixed angle uh, scattering. Well, so when everything is very large, we can just use the crudest approximation that there is for a gamma arch. That is gamma of x is equal to x to the power x plus times corrections. And those corrections will all be something else. Okay, so gamma of x is x to the power x. So here what do we have? Now we can forget about the ones and twos and so on. So, uh, what do we have in S? We have up here, it's minus alpha prime to S by 4 to the power minus alpha prime S by 4. And in the denominator, we have alpha prime S by 4 to the power alpha prime S by 4. The modulus of this, if we take modulus, this goes like alpha prime S by 4 to the power minus alpha prime s by 2. Okay? Or oh, well, it's often written as e to the power minus uh, uh, e to the power minus alpha prime s by 2 times the power of s. Okay. The key point uh, when s is large, this, this log s is a slowly growing function. So roughly speaking, but well, this is even further down, but uh, roughly speaking, this, this amplitude is exponentially damped at large s. 
And uh, uh, the thing that sets the dimensions for this exponential damping is the string theory. Okay, now can you give me a physical interpretation? It's quite a Okay, so the first thing is that this, this is a very important point. So very important part of the string, string, string scattering becomes very small at very high energies. It's very important because it's the opposite of the behavior of graviton graviton scattering from the Einstein approach. Graviton graviton scattering becomes very large apparently at high energies. So the effective gravitational coupling involves powers of the momentum. Okay? So this exponential damping of high energy amplitudes, which is a general feature of string theory, okay, is at the heart of the finiteness of string theory. Uh, we haven't yet shown, but you know that string loop amplitudes are finite. They don't need to be cut off. The, the physical reason for this is the exponential damping. Things don't interact very much by high energies. Okay. Now, can you give me a physical interpretation of exponential? Have you in your study of physics before encountered an exponential behavior of a scattering amplitude? Yeah, in a very important experiment, something changed physics at the turn of the last century. You know, Rutherford scattering. You, you know, the way Rutherford discovered the structure of the of the atom was by taking electrons and throwing it at the atom. And he'd done the calculation that showed him that you know they, they were uh, they knew that there were you know, positive and negative charges in the atom. Uh, one model was this I don't know plum pudding model of the atom. Like, there's this large soup of I don't know some some model in which the charge the negative charge of the atom and maybe the positive I don't even know what but so the charge of the atom is uniformly spread over a, over the radius of the atom. Had that been the case, the scattering. The scattering of, uh, uh, of electrons from the atom would have been very, very small. Okay? It's just a general feature of Fourier transformation that if you scatter at a small wavelength over a source that is very large, the part of the source that you scatter from is the, the part that clicks with your Fourier transform. And if it's like, you know, if it has a length scale that is very much larger than the length scale associated with your scattering length, you get exponential separation just from the Fourier transform. You know, Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. It is exponentially suppressed at very, very high k. Okay? That's not what Rutherford found. Rutherford found was every once in a while you get these zings corresponding to the fact that the source that was doing the scattering was very small because it's a localized nucleus. This is a totally important experiment, turn of the last century. Now, what we see in string theory is the opposite of that behavior. What we're seeing is that when we scatter energies high compared to uh, high compared to the string scale, when we make our moment more, when we get small compared to string scale, we get this exponential damping. So it's what Rutherford had originally expected. It tells you that string states are big fuzzy objects on string size, on string scale, and the form factor, which is fancy way of saying Fourier transform, of the source from which scattering occurs causes exponential damping as strings scattering against each other at very high energies. The key to the exponential damping is that strings are big fuzzy objects of oh, strings. Do we, do we have to stop, Ajay? Yeah. yeah, we have to stop. Okay, it's just one more minute, just one more minute. Okay, so th 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 that's what happens at high energy fixed scattering. Now, there is another, there is another thing that we have to, that, 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 that was historically, it was, is physically important in string theory. Uh, and that is high energy scattering, not at fixed angles, but when you take S large, but at fixed T. Now you can ask what the hell is that, and you can check by going through the formulae that that corresponds to taking S to infinity while keeping S times theta squared fixed. So you're, you're looking at low angle scattering, and the, how long the angle is goes to the angle goes to zero as S goes to infinity. Okay? Uh, okay, I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise, which I really urge you guys to do. It's five minutes, but please do it. When you when you calculate, you use the uh, starting approximation on, on this stuff in in the large S fixed T limit. Remember, if you take large S and fixed T, you must be taking large U as well, because S plus T plus U is equal to one. Okay, so large S fixed T limit. What you find is S to the power S to the power. Which is the right formula? Crazy way. Minus two 